So we'll do some scaling uh, or stretcher. Stretcher compression is another word that we use for scaling. I just use scaling because that's what your textbook uses this quarter. So I'll write AKA uh, stretching, stretch or compression. So your book says scaling, but it's the same as stretching or compressing, which I think is what your pre-calculus textbook used. Um, if you took it here and probably one of these three words is what your pretty much every textbook is going to use. So we'll do, we did square root. We'll just keep going with the square root graph. So we'll graph uh, g of x equals 4 square root x. So first of all, horizontal or vertical? And uh, we'll look at the two, vertical or horizontal. So is it, do we multiply the x by 4 or the function of x by 4? Function of x. So if the times 4 was right next to x, it would be horizontal. So we have our uh, vertical going on. So c times f of x, it's a graph of, g of f uh, scaled vertically by, in our case, 4. So we're going to have a vertical stretch by 4. So we know our original graph. So I call that the base graph, which is y equals square root x. We did this last class, so I'll just do a real fast recreation. All right, so we want to stretch it by four. So the way you want to think about stretching, this double vertical arrow is a good uh, visualization of this process. So you want to just think about taking your graph and sort of pulling it away from the x-axis. So you want to think about just stretching it away from the x-axis. If you're not a visual person, what you can do, the easy way to do this is take all your y-coordinates, multiply by four. So that's one of the easy ways to do it. So take all your y-coordinates, which are 0, 1, and 2, multiply by 4. So that math is pretty easy to do. That'll be 0, 4, and 8. So it's going to get a whole lot taller. 0, 4, 8. You don't need to label all the ones we're not going to use. Just label the uh, 0, 4, and 8. And your x-coordinates stay the same, so we still need 1 through 4. So we got 0, 0. All your x intercepts are not going to move when you multiply by 4. So your y values were 0 before, multiply by 4, they're still 0. So 1, 1 goes up to 1, 4. And then 4, 2 is going to go to 4, 8. So we get this very stretched out version of our original graph. So any vertical stretch questions? All right, our... Why does the y move but not the x? Uh, because your... So when you plug in... So using the clueless method to get these three points, uh, if we did a table of values, we basically use 0, 1, and 4 for our x values. So if I go 4 square root x right here, it'll be 4 square root 0, which is 0, and then 4 square root 1, which is 4, and then 4 square root 4, which is 4 times 2, and that is 8. Thank so you. it's basically your, your input's treated the same, it's just your output's going to change. Okay. All right, so our last example for graphing, obviously we need to do a scaling in the horizontal direction. So let's do square root negative 2x. All right. So obviously we just did vertical, so this is horizontal. How would I know it was horizontal if it wasn't the last one that I haven't done yet? It's right next to x, and x is not added. There's no addition, subtraction. There's multiplication. So multiply by negative 2. 
So I'm going to have a horizontal stretch by negative. Now, is this going to get twice as wide or half as wide? Half. half. So it looks like I'm multiplying by 2, but all your horizontals are the opposite of what they look like. So the opposite of multiplying by negative 2 is multiply by negative 1 half. You want to be a little careful. It's not multiply by positive 2. That's not the opposite of multiplying by negative 2. If we're in addition, that would be the opposite. But we're multiplying. So the opposite of multiplying by negative 2 is multiplying by negative 1 half. So it is going to be our original base graph. So again, we're starting with our base graph here. And we're going to take all of our x values and multiply them by negative 1 half. And I like to write, um, if I know I'm multiplying, a lot of times it's convenient to write negative one half in parentheses just so your brain's thinking about multiplication instead of subtracting one half. All right, so our x values are 0, 1, and 4. And all I'm going to do is multiply them by negative one half. So 0 times negative one half is still 0. 1 times negative one half is minus one half. So there's minus 1 half minus 1. Now 4 times negative 1 half. So that's negative 1. And there will be negative 2. So it's a little bit tricky because we have fractions and whole numbers. So I try to make all my whole numbers. Those marks are going to be bold. And then my little fraction marks are the little small uh, dash lines. So we got negative 1 half. I could try to squeeze in a negative 1 right there. And I'm not going to label negative 3 halves. And we got negative 2. Y values stay the same. So we got 1 and 2 still. So we got 0, 0, negative 1 half, 1, negative 2, 2. And then do your best to draw that curve. And there's our final graph right there. So just looking at the graph, what is the domain of g of x? So it would be negative infinity through 0. So you want to think about what x values are on the graph, negative infinity to 0. So could I get the domain without looking at the graph? If I didn't know what the graph looked like and didn't want to make it, kind of get the domain right off the original g of x equals negative uh, square root negative 2x. Yes. So we did this in pre-calculus a lot. So if I wanted to figure out the domain without the graph, so if I want to just compute the domain directly, so we have our g of x square root negative 2x. So what I want to do is think about the input for square root has to be 0 or more. So what I do is I set up an inequality. I need to check. So I need to know when is 0 less than or equal to negative 2x. So I just say, here's 2x, negative 2x, and I want to make sure it's greater than 0. So I set up this inequality. What do I do to solve for x? What algebra? So I can either divide by negative 2, or I could multiply by what number? Negative 1 half. So either way, uh, I like multiplying better. So I will spend a lot more time multiplying and dividing. So I'll multiply by negative 1 half. Good news is uh, 0 times negative 1 half is still 0. So I don't need to spend much brain power there. The reason we chose negative 1 half is to cancel the negative 2. So they'll cancel out. <coughs> What's wrong with what I just wrote down? It's mostly correct. Except if I don't flip the sign, it's also very wrong. So I multiply by negative. Same thing if you divide by negative, you're also going to need to turn the sign around. So I had to reverse the sign. So I had to reverse the inequality. Since I multiply, so when multiplying, 
by negative. So reverse our inequality when multiplying by negative. Now, inequalities, for me, are easier to read if we go small on the left, big on the right. So I'm just going to take the mirror image of that inequality. So I got small thing on the left, which is x, big thing, which is 0 on the right. You do a number line. Here's 0. It's OK to equal 0. So I want everything to the left of 0, right there. So negative infinity up to 0. And you always go open at negative infinity or positive infinity. So we can get our domain using algebra right here. Now another thing that you should have learned in pre-calculus 1, when you have inequalities, if you multiply by anything with x in it, that thing could be positive or negative. So if you ever multiply by something that's not a number, anything that has x in it, that could be positive or negative. So hopefully in pre-calculus 1, you learned uh, inequalities are dangerous if you have uh, anything other than linear. If you have any x squared terms and you have to do some fancy algebra, your inequality is better solved with the graph. Uh, but we're not going to worry about that uh, directly here. There may be one or two homework problems that have that. Actually, maybe I do not have an example like that. I know we had to do an easy factoring problem, I think. Oh, we looked at a homework problem and never solved it. That's what we did. We looked at a homework problem and never solved it. So we'll do a more serious domain question before we get into trig, which is the next section. So when does graphing get more difficult? What we just did wasn't terribly difficult. None of you looked too troubled or confused. It's not because graphing is easy. What is difficult about all these transformations when we graph? When they're all together and you have three or four transformations and you have to do them in the right order. So generally, we're going to shift before we uh, scale, or no, or stretch before you shift. Uh, so I'm not going to spend the two days that it, we would need to go through all of graphing. But when you have two of them, two or more uh, transformations, it becomes more difficult because you have to do them in the right order and in the right form. So let's run over to web work, get a problem. Yeah, uh, that also depends on if it's, if it's factored or not. So there's, there's a lot of nuance in there about graphing. That takes quite a while to go through, and that's a really uh, pre-calculus one uh, exercise we're not going to do right now. So we're going to do web work. Eventually, All right, so all of you know the password for Obama, so you can help him improve his grade if you're bored, um, or if you don't like the version of the problem that you're looking at. I think his grade's like 1%, maybe 2% at this point. It's pretty bad. Sounds about right. <laughs> Sounds about right. I think he graduated Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> pretty sure he didn't have 1% or 2%. <laughs> Although I don't know how I did in pre-calculus. I don't think that's a required course for law school. There's a pretty solid chance he wouldn't do well at pre-calculus class. All right, I'm trying to look for a domain question. This is 1.2. Are the domain questions in 1.1? Ah, that's why I'm not finding anything I want. So I want to do a square root domain of a quadratic. All right, so I think we looked at this one right here. 
And uh, to do this, you just want to make sure you're not divided by 0. And you pick all the x values that make you not divide by 0. Same thing here. OK, so this one should be pretty good. So we got the fourth root of x squared minus 6x. So let's run back to our notes. Whoa, I think it was x, was it x squared minus 6x? So this is not square root. However, it's similar because it's an even root. So every even root has to be uh, 0 or more. If it was a third root or a fifth root, negatives are OK. But all the even roots uh, have the same domain as if they were just a square root. So I want to know when is 0 greater than or equal to everything I underlined. So it looks pretty innocent. I absolutely could add 6x to both sides. Now when I do this, does it matter when I add if something was negative? Add, subtract, inequalities don't care. Multiplication division is a different story. So you might be tempted, for example, to divide by x. What did I assume if I divide everything by x? Yep. First of all, I assumed it wasn't 0 also, or I couldn't divide by x. So I basically threw away a 0 solution. And the other thing I did, if I don't flip my inequality sign, I assumed x was greater than 0. So if I write this down, I also have the assumption that x is greater than 0. What happens if, so and x is greater than 0. Could x be less than 0? Sure. So I have another thing to worry about. So I have to go, or, so if x was negative when I divided, I would have to flip my inequality sign and keep track of x now being negative. So I have two separate problems, each of which are two inequalities. So now I have basically, and these are separate right here, so I have one solution down here and another solution over here which I can keep going. All right, x is greater than or equal to 0. So here's 0. x is going to be in this interval. But I also have to worry about x being greater than or equal to 6 as well. So where 6, we'll say it's right here. So I need x to be inside both intervals right here. So I'm going to do what's called intersecting them. So I want to know what's in common to both of these. What interval is the intersection of these two? So I want to know what is in common to both of these I just drew. Everything greater than 6. Yeah, 6 and more. So you go 6 to infinity. Is it OK to include the number 6? Is 6 the number 6 in both intervals? Yep. So I go 6 to infinity right there. All right, other side. <coughs> so that was our first solution right there. Our second part, we're going to need to, I like to write my inequalities with little on the left, big on the right. x less than or equal to 6. So here is 6. I am less than or equal to 6. So we're going to the left side of 6. And then x is less than or equal to 0. So there's 0 right there. So I want to know what is the intersection or what is in common to both of these intervals right here. So we're going to negative infinity. So it goes negative infinity. What do I stop at? Zero. So I want to go to 0. And 0 is inside both of these. So I'm going to include right there. So if I put these together, I could say x is in 6 comma infinity or x is in 
negative infinity, comma, zero. So we're just putting them both together. I know it's either in the first interval or the second interval. So what math symbol can I use instead of the word or? Union. So I can go union. So if this is a web work answer, I'm going to use U for union. I like to put the small one first. So it's ordered sort of small to big, left to right, negative infinity to zero, union, six comma infinity. Nope, that's the worst way to do that. So quadratic is relatively easy compared to cubic or fourth degree inequality. So if I had a higher degree inequality, uh, this step right here, I would probably have to divide by a lot more than just uh, one term. I'd probably have to divide out a few times. And then I would have, uh, it would be horrible. And I don't want to go through that right now. It would probably take 30 minutes to solve a degree three maybe 10 minutes if I didn't talk and went quickly. You have to factor the polynomial and then very carefully figure out uh, when x is positive and negative and all that fun stuff. All right, so this is all correct, but in my opinion, bad, and it's only really going to work for degree two. As soon as you go up higher degrees, this is going to break down and be almost impossible. So this is a valid but bad solution. I have a question mark to make that a complete sentence. So I'm going to cross this out. It's not wrong, but it is bad. And not bad like Michael Jackson bad, but bad like we're not going to do it bad. All right, so let's answer this question in the right way. So I'll rewrite the question down here. It was x squared minus 6x. So what we're going to do, we're going to let, our original function was f, so I'll just give this the name g of x. What we're going to do is we're going to graph g of x, then uh, figure out, then we're going to answer when is, so here, x squared minus 6x is g of x, so we're going to answer when is 0 less than or equal to g of x. Of course, g of x is our y values. So how do we graph quadratics? That's another flashback to pre-calculus class. So we can factor them. That will give us our x-intercepts. I could go for vertex as another nice thing to get. So if I knew vertex and the x-intercepts, I could graph my quadratic pretty easily. So let's go ahead and figure out all that. All right, fast way to get vertex. Who remembers? Negative b over 2a. Negative b over, t over 2a. And then to get the y value, you g that negative b over 2a number. And so we'll get the vertex first. So I'll write as 1x squared minus 6x plus 0. I'm writing the plus 0 because that'll, I can see a, b, and c when I write it out like this. So I want to write a is 1, b is negative 6. I'm not going to actually use C, but C is 0 in our case right here. So we get negative, negative 6 divided by 2 times 1. Ne 2 wrongs make a right, so that's 6 over 2, which is positive 3. So our x value is positive 3, and we're going to G. Take 3 and G that. So we get 3 squared minus 6 times 3, which is 9 minus 18, equals negative 9. All right, there's our vertex. Now we're going to look for x-intercepts. So I'm going to set intentionally 0 equals g of x. 
I could add 6 to both sides, divide by x. If I do that, when I divide by x, do I have to worry about it being negative and changing my equation? Does it matter if x was negative 5 when I do this? There is one x value I have to worry about. Zero. Zero. Negative six could, would still be okay. So what, what I'm saying is I, I don't have to worry about the equality sign changing by multiplying or dividing by negative. Uh, so you can divide by terms on an equation, not worrying about uh, if things are going to flip around. Uh, unfortunately, what I just did was throw away a solution. So x equals six, yes, that, that works. What solution did I throw away? Zero. So there's x equals zero solution. So my x equals 0 solution was discarded if you just make this move right here. All right, so what's my favorite F word? Factor, very good. Unless I'm playing Overwatch. And then it's probably flank if things are going well. Um, all right, solution. So what should I do instead? I should factor. So I'm going to cross this out, not because it's wrong, but again, because it is bad math. All right, very easy factoring on this one. I don't have to do any fancy uh, complete the square or think, thinking about uh, you know, what two numbers add up to this and multiply to that. That would be a regular quadratic. I have to figure out all that stuff. You know, is it negative 2, positive 3, all that, those fun things. What do I do to factor this? Very easy. Take out next. They both got next. So this one's super easy. All right. Now, really fancy theorem or property, zero product property. Two things multiply make zero. There's only one way to do that, and it's if one of the two are zero. So we got our zero product property. Now, we saw this a lot in pre-calculus with polynomials. We would factor them out, and every factor would correspond to a zero. So that just uses the zero product property. You know, a bunch of things multiply to make zero. Individually, they could all be zero. So we got x equals zero, or x minus six equals zero. So x equals zero or six. There we go. We didn't throw away a solution. And we got our x-intercepts right there. So these are also x-intercepts. So now we can graph. And we'll just graph right here by our x-intercepts. 0, 6, turns out I don't actually need to know specifically where our vertex is. The only thing that matters is a happy or sad parabola. And is g of x, zoom in on g of x. All right, here's our g of x. Happy or sad? How do you know it's happy? Positive. So the positive 1 x squared. So our big term x squared is positive, so we're happy. So we have a happy parabola. So it's going to generally just look like a smile. Uh, our specific smile is going to cut through these two points and look something like this. Why am I allowed to be imprecise? There was something I was very precise about. And those are the x-intercepts. So I want to know, the only thing I need, the only property on this graph that I need is to figure out somewhere, when is g of x above the x-axis? So when is g of x above or, or equal to above or on the x-axis. It will be. It better be, or else we made a mistake somewhere. So we're going to use the, I call these the horns of the graph right here. 
So I want the parts above the x-axis. So I want these two pieces. I do not want the actual smile part. I just want the two pieces sticking out. So I want everything that's above the x-axis. <coughs> now how do we answer this question? We need to say what x values do we, do we use right here? So the x values are negative infinity, comma, zero, and we're going to include zero. It's okay to equals, uh, to be on the y x-axis. And then the other one is six to positive infinity. So we go union, six to infinity. And that is our final answer. So vertex is useful for certain things. Uh, we didn't actually need it for our purposes here on this problem. Um, if we write out the, so we got three negative nine was our vertex. If I go over here and label it, there's three. Obviously our Y scale is not correct. It doesn't look like negative nine. Uh, if I wanted to make a more accurate graph, it probably would have looked uh, something more like that right there, a lot steeper. However, to answer this question, that's not relevant. It doesn't matter how far down it went. I just need to know above x-axis or below. So unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all the details of graphing, but that's all pre-calculus one stuff right there. So any domain questions you have? Uh, overall, there's two things to worry about. Don't divide by zero. So do not divide by zero. And the second one was uh, s no square roots of negatives. And I write no square roots, but that also means no even roots. So we did a fourth degree, a fourth root problem. Same thing would have been six or eight or ten, ten root. Uh, there was a third one in pre-calculus class. I'm going to put an asterisk because it won't happen until next quarter. There's another type of function we looked at the domain. I know this is way back to pre-calculus one class. That was beers ago or eggnogs ago. Third one, what did we learn near the end of pre-calculus one class? We did matrices. What did we do right before matrices? It's good memory. We did imaginary numbers, right? It was what we did, I think, right after imaginary numbers, which was the end of polynomials. So we did logarithms and exponentials. So all the logarithms you also have to worry about. Hopefully I spelled it right. Uh, I'm going to cross it out because this is uh, calculus two. So that's calculus two. So when you take calculus two, we do some quick review of uh, logarithms, the, pr the log properties and exponential properties. So we're not doing any log and exponential in uh, calculus one. So we don't have to worry about any of that. So you only have two things to worry about in domain. Uh, that also means we're going to skip 1.4 in our review, which is logs and exponentials. So we're going to do our trig 1.3 review, and then we'll be on to calculus in chapter 2. So 1.3 is trig functions. All right, trig functions came from pre-calculus 2 class, so that should have been a lot more fresh in your mind. That was just last quarter. So hopefully trig function is a little more fresh. So we're going to use almost entirely radians. And probably the most important property of radians you need, one rotation counterclockwise. So there's a whole lot to write out. So we'll summarize all that. One rot CCW equals how many radians? 
Tupai. So hopefully that was fresh in your mind. Uh, Tupai radians, how many degrees? 360. So that is probably the most important thing to remember. There's another probably 100 things you have to remember too, but this is probably the most important thing at the very beginning to know. All right, that is one rotation. Uh, another good one to memorize. Regular pi, just cut that in half. Regular pi is 180, which would be a half rotation. So we'll do an arc length real quick. Uh, well, we're talking about degrees and radians, so we'll do... So I could solve for, if I divide by pi on both sides, one radian equals, I'm gonna divide by pi, 180 degrees over pi. And if I do the opposite, which is divide by 180 degrees, or one, divide by 180, pi radians divided by 180 equals one uh, degree. So depending on what you're doing, especially a lot of you are either science majors or have taken at least some chemistry or physics and you did unit conversions. You may have done it in biology or, or science or something like that. So you did some unit conversions at some point. So these will feel more like scientific unit conversions if you uh, do this 180 over pi or uh, pi over 180. So that'll feel more like uh, doing unit conversions. Ah, so let's do our conversions right now. So we'll convert 120 degrees. Now because we use radians almost all the time, we get lazy and don't keep writing radian, 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 radian. It takes too long. So we just get lazy and don't write any units when we're using radians. So radian is sort of our default. So I want to convert 120 degrees to radians. There's a few ways to do it. The way I taught in pre-calculus class when we did this is begin with something we know. We know that 2 pi rads equals 360 degrees. What can I multiply by to get 120 degrees? One third. One third. Or you could divide by three if you're a divider. So I'm a multiplier, not a divider. So I'm going to multiply by one third. Remember, uh, algebra is like communism. Both, everybody gets the same thing. So both sides are going to get multiplied by a third. So we got 2 pi over 3 equals 120 degrees. I'm going to be lazy and not write 2 pi rads. So we just know that it's in radians. Almost all the time when you have a pi, you're dealing with radians. So probably more than 99% of the time, if you see pi, you're working in radians. So there's our 2 pi over 3. Now, if you're a science person and you really want to go unit conversion, so if we go the science way, I can multiply 120. Let's actually be careful with our units somewhere. I'm going to Normally, I don't really care about units, but I know a lot of you are science people, so you, you know foot's not equal to an inch and all those things, and that's really important if you're actually measuring things in the real world. You want to know what units you're using. Uh, I'm going to divide by radian and just write 1 equals 180 degrees over pi rads. And I'm going to divide by degrees here, so pi rads divided by 180 degrees equals 1. If I use these two, this will, should feel a lot like a scientific conversion. I should have degrees on the bottom, but 
it's okay to do this. What is going to be, well, I don't really want to multiply 120 by 180. But what is, aside from an ugly number, what are my units going to be? They're almost going to be degrees over radians. Degrees squared. You ever use degrees squared? Nope. So I don't think this is going to be a good way to convert. So let's not go this way. So let's go the opposite. I want to not have degrees. So we're going to go 180 degrees on the bottom and pi rads on the top. And now 120 over 180. Let's pretend that I knew that was 2 thirds pi rads because your degrees are going to cancel out now. Your units cancel out and there should feel like a chemistry problem or a physics problem where all your units work out. All right, and 12 over 18 does, should reduce to 2 thirds if you spend a little time to do that. But I already knew the answer, so I sort of cheated and just used 2 thirds right there. All right, so that's the science way. You're absolutely free to do these whatever way you want to. Uh, you can do inequality the ugly way if you really want to. I strongly recommend against that. So we'll do one more conversion. We'll go the other direction. And we'll do negative 5 pi over 4 rads 2 degrees. So I showed you two separate ways to do this, so I want you to convert this. You can either go the science way, if you're a science person, or the math way, which is probably the way you did it in pre-calculus 2 class last quarter. So whatever way you want to go, go for it. Uh, when is it? Yeah. It's before this class at 8 a.m. You won't need a huge amount of trigonometry for Calc 1. Um, you will need it in Calc 2. Yeah. Since I'm going engineering, I think I need to make sure my foundation is secure. Yeah, we do some physics in there too as well. Hard to tell at this point. Yeah. I can get a good idea. Yeah, as as Two twenty five? Oh, yeah. What's five times one eighty? Five times one eighty. Nine hundred. Nine hundred. I say one eighty. All right, so you can go either way. You can divide by four first and then multiply by five second, or you could multiply by five first, divide by four second. You can choose. Uh, I recommend go the easy way. So probably divide first when your number's not so bad. As long as you're divisible by four, it should work. All right, so we go negative 225 degrees. So we don't use calculators in here. So you're going to have to uh, multiply, add, subtract by hand. I try not to make numbers much worse than what you see on the screen right here. It's probably as bad as it'll get. So you're not going to have to multiply. Uh, if you start multiplying and you're in the, uh, especially get to the thousands, or you're doing with crazy denominators uh, on a quiz or a midterm, something probably went wrong. Your homeworks are a different story. The numbers on your homeworks are sort of made up, uh, so they can be kind of bad. So homeworks can have some ugly numbers, but generally your quiz and midterms won't have numbers that are that bad.